Greetings everyone and welcome back to the last video of this series. We've learned a lot over the last eight videos, so the purpose of this video is to tie it all together and actually do something with it. The purpose of this video is to learn how to program something different than an ATmega328. Now we want to stay in the AVR family because as soon as you leave that, the process changes up a little bit. I decided to go with the ATtiny85 today and we're going to make that blink. And the only reason that I decided to go with this one is because it's small, it's cheap, and it's one that I actually have lying around that can fit in a breadboard. Now remember, this is a review video. And if it seems like I'm going through topics really fast in this video, that's because I've already covered them in a lot more detail in previous videos. I tried my best to call out which video is applicable to which step throughout this entire video, so that way you can go back and brush up on some of the topics if you need to. A lot of people get started with something like the Arduino Uno. It's fairly basic, easy to use, and works really well with the Arduino IDE, and it teaches you some of the basics of microcontrollers. After that, you can always branch out into other Arduino-supported development boards, like the Arduino Mega or Nano. Or if you really want to go above and beyond, you can try other development boards, like the Mega Pro or the DigiSpark or the Pro Micro. And these are just the AVR-based development boards I have laying around the lab. So maybe you're making your own project or your own circuit board and you want to work directly with the microcontroller instead of using a development board. These things come in all shapes and sizes and are pretty cheap and easy to get your hands on. But sometimes I feel limited by only being able to pick microcontrollers supported by the Arduino IDE. Some of these have footprints that are tough to tinker around with for the first time, but you can always solder them onto a breakout board and then solder pin headers onto them and use them on a breadboard. Today I'm going to use the ATtiny85 because it's cheap, small, and is already pretty popular in the Arduino community. The goal of the first two videos was to isolate ourselves from the Arduino code base, so all of these nice little functions like digital write we ended up replacing with direct register manipulation, so such as port B and then setting it to a specific value. The second video shed some light onto where these magical registers come from and how we can access them from a very specific memory address by looking it up in the datasheet. After that, we learned how to walk away from the hardware and run our microcontroller directly on a breadboard in a bare-bones setup. In a later video, we simplified it even more by getting rid of the crystal oscillator and using the one that's built into the microcontroller. Next, we covered how to program your microcontroller from scratch without needing the Arduino bootloader. We did this by using an ICSP programmer. And if you don't have one of these, you can use a second Arduino as an ICSP programmer. And in the last few videos, we looked at how to compile code outside of the Arduino IDE using AVRGCC and eventually push it to the microcontroller using AVRDUDE, and there's this middle step in between which converts the output of AVRGCC into something that AVRDUDE knows how to handle. So let's see if we can use that knowledge to program an ATtiny85 from scratch and get it to blink an LED. First thing I like to do with any breadboard project is to connect the power and ground rails together. After that, we can add the microcontroller. Now we can hook up power and ground by referencing the datasheet. Now we'll add a pull-up resistor from the reset pin up to 5 volts so our microcontroller won't spontaneously reset. And now we can hook up an LED with a current limiting resistor to an arbitrary pin that we'll control through the software later. Pins 2 and 3 are crystal 1 and crystal 2 respectively, but the question is, do we actually need those? We can find the answer by hunting through the datasheet, looking for anything that talks about crystals or clocks, and eventually we end up at this part that describes the default clock source. It tells us that the default clock source is set to the internal oscillator, and after all the prescaling, our system clock runs at 1 MHz. You're more than welcome to leave your clock at the default settings, but for the sake of this exercise, we're going to change the fuse bits to allow our device to run at 8 MHz. There's some awesome online tools like this one, which will help you figure out how to set your fuse bits, but since the goal of this video is to use any microcontroller, I'm going to figure this out by only looking at the datasheet. So we're back to hunting through the datasheet to find information out about these fuse bytes. And if we get down a little bit further, we find this low fuse byte. And right at the very top, we find this CKDIV8. And the description is that it divides the clock by 8. By default, it's set to 0, which means that it's on or programmed, meaning that our clock is being divided by 8. Now, since we want to take advantage of the full 8 MHz, that means that we want to disable this clock divider, which means that we want to change its value from a 0, which is the default, to a 1. And if we do that and leave everything else as it is default, we end up with this number here. And if you convert that to hex, we have E2. So by setting our L fuse equal to E2, we will then turn off the clock divider. From video number 5, we know that we can use AVR dude to set the L fuse, but first we have to wire it up. We need to know what each pin on our programmer is. I'm using this USB Tiny ISP, and I like to write the pin out on the back so I don't have to memorize it. Just as a reminder, you could be using an Arduino as an ICSP programmer instead of this. We can start by plugging in six jumper wires into our ICSP programmer. 
These are the colors that I used for each pin. Now we can hook up the other end of the pins to the breadboard. We'll start by hooking up power to the power rails, then the reset pin, and finally the three SPI pins, which are clock, MISO, and MOSI. Now that everything's wired up, we should be able to use AVR Dude to change our fuse bits or upload code. In video five, we saw that AVR Dude takes in these different arguments. The first one is the path to the configuration file. You can find this by searching your system for avrdude.conf. The next thing is the part number of the microcontroller. Next, we have the type of programmer we're using. And finally, the command that we want to do, so like changing a fuse bit or uploading code. We can do a dry run by getting rid of the dash U flag just to make sure that we have everything hooked up correctly. The programmer that I'm using is USB Tiny ISP, but now we need to figure out what the part number is for our microcontroller. It's a AT Tiny 85. We can look at the online documentation for AVR Dude where they give us a list of all of the microcontrollers, but this time I notice that we can use a dash P question mark to list all of the parts available. So let's try this out. If I type in AVR Dude dash P question mark, it's going to yell at me here saying that it can't find the configuration file. And that's because for some reason my configuration file doesn't live in the default directory, so I have to go manually find it. To find it, I just do a system search for avrdude.conf and copy the file path name. So now I can do avrdude-c and paste in this location to my avrdude configuration file, and now I can do dash p question mark. And here you can see that we have everything listed on here. And I'm going to go find the attiny85, which is right here, which means that the part number is t85. So with this information, we have enough to fill in the blank, so we can run AVR Dude with our dash C and then our configuration path. Uh, for dash P, we can use our T85 for our part number, and for our programmer, lowercase c, we're using USB Tiny. And just running it like this, AVR Dude starts by asking, what are you? And the microcontroller responds with this hex number, and that hex number is the identifier for all ATtiny85 chips. And after that, we read through the fuse bits, and it tells us what they're currently set to. As we mentioned earlier, we want to turn off the clock divider by 8, so that means that we want to set our L fuse equal to E2 in hex. So adding this command at the end of AVR dude, the dash U for user code, this will allow us to program the L fuse by writing a value to it. Uh, that value will be E2, and then the format of the data, M means immediate. So we can go ahead and do that by hitting up to get to our previous command and adding dash U, L fuse, colon W to write, 0x E2 to set it to E2, and M. And now it looks like after all this came through, it does the same thing. It says, what are you? And it responds with that. And then it writes the byte to memory there, and then it reads it back all the way at the end. And now we can verify that the low fuse is set to E2 now instead of 62 like it was before. Now it's time to write some code. In video one, we learned how to manipulate registers directly. So we could set a pin as an output by changing the data direction register, and we could turn it on and off by manipulating the port register. I wired up my LED to physical pin six on the microcontroller, which is pin PB1. This means that we need to set PB1 as an output by changing DDRB and then turning it on and off by changing the value of port B. In video two, we learned how to define the address location of DDRB and port B by using these define statements and pointing them to a specific spot in the microcontroller's memory. So we're gonna have to look up these memory addresses in the data sheet. So we'll just do a search for port B and keep spamming the enter key until we find out where it's defined. So right here we can see the memory address of the port B data register, and right here we have the address of the port B data direction register. So we can plug these memory addresses into our define statements. If this doesn't look familiar, take a peek at video two. So let's code this up. We'll do vim mitch.c. Since this is covered in depth in previous videos, I'm not going to take the time to explain this in depth. This is really just a low-level way of writing a blink example that you're probably all familiar with. Now we're ready to compile our code, which I covered in video 6, and we can do this using avrgcc. This dash os flag means optimized for size, which is covered in video number 8. And then here we have to specify which microcontroller we're using, so that way the compiler knows which instruction set it can use. And then our source file is where we'll put mitch.c. But the question is, what do we put in here for the microcontroller for an attiny85? Well, one way to find this up is to look in the manual page. So I'm going to do man avrgcc. That's the whole manual for this. And we can type in slash and then mmcu, which should help us find the mcu flag. And here it is described. I can keep hitting n on my keyboard until we eventually get down to a list. So we eventually make it down to here. And near the bottom, we can see that the attiny85 is defined. Interestingly enough, this is part of the AVR25 instruction set, which is different than what the ATmega328 uses, which is AVR5. 
That just means that the instruction set or assembly instructions allowed for these programs are different between the two microcontrollers. So now we can try to compile our code. We can type in ls to see our file name is mitch.c. So we can do avr gcc dash os to optimize for size, which is optional, dash mmcu equals, and then the name of our microcontroller, which is attiny85, which is what we just looked up. And then our source file is mitch.c. If I hit enter, it looks like everything compiled without any errors. As we discussed in video six, AVR dude doesn't know how to use the raw output from AVR GCC, so there's this intermediate step called AVR object copy that can translate from the output of AVR GCC to what AVR dude can use. And the command to do that is right here. We start by calling AVR object copy and we specify the output format as Intel hex, which is one of the many formats that AVR dude supports. These dash J commands are optional. They tell it to just copy the dot text and dot data sections of our program. Then we specify what our input file is, which is a.out generated from AVRGCC, and our final output file will be called a.hex. And this is something that AVR dude can then push to our microcontroller. So let's do it. If we type in ls, we can see that we have an a.out file generated from AVRGCC. We'll type in AVR obj copy and specify our output format as Intel hex dash j dot text and dash j dot data and our input file is a.out and our output file we'll call a.hex. Now that we've got our a.hex file it's time to push it to the microcontroller using AVR dude and this looks almost identical to what we were doing when we were setting the fuse bit. The only difference is that our user command is a little different. This time we're going to write to flash memory. We're going to specify our a.hex file here and now our format is i which stands for Intel hex. So we can go ahead and do that. We can type in AVR dude. Our configuration file is pasted in from earlier. Our part is a T85, an ATtiny85. Our programmer is a USB tiny. And our user command is to flash. We want to write. Our file is a.hex, so we can type in a.hex. And our format is I for Intel hex. So if we hit enter, it should push the code. And it looks like we see some activity, and at the very end, it echoes out our fuse bits back to us. If we watch the breadboard, we can see the LED flicker when our code is uploading, but then everything goes dark. This honestly took quite a bit of time for me to debug, and I had to go back and watch my first video to see if I could catch what I did wrong. And I noticed that the ATmega328 data sheet, where it lists the port numbers, it, it lists two addresses. There's one over here without parentheses, and then one in parentheses, whereas the ATtiny just lists this one memory address. So if we jump back to the data sheet, there's this data memory diagram in section 5, and it shows the input-output registers as starting at address 2.0 in hex. And it looks like this is awfully similar to the ATmega328 because you can see this memory address of 0b, if we were to add 2.0 in hex, we'd end up with 2b. So it seems like we need to do that same thing for the ATtiny. That just means that we need to jump back to our register declarations and redefine DDRB as memory address 37 and port B as memory address 38 instead of 17 and 18. So let's go ahead and change the 17 and 18 to a 37 and 38, which is just adding 2.0 and hex to it. And we'll save and exit the file. Now we'll run AVR GCC, AVR OBJ copy, and AVR dude one more time. We see the LED flicker while the code uploads, and then it goes right into a loop of turning the LED on and off just like it's supposed to. At this point, we can disconnect all of the pins from the programmer and then hook up just power and ground and let the microcontroller run on its own. And that's it. That wraps up the fundamentals of microcontrollers. With this knowledge, you should be able to get just about any AVR microcontroller up and running, and, and honestly, you could probably try other branded microcontrollers because they all seem to share the same fundamental rules. I originally planned on using the STM8 in this series, but this video is such a clean ending point that I wanted to cut it off here before leaving the AVR family and trying to enter something else. This was my first video series on really anything, so if you have any feedback, please let me know. So that wraps everything up, and I'll see you eventually.